Welcome to Manifold. My guest today is Vlatko Vidral. He's a professor of theoretical physics, both at Oxford University and the National University of Singapore. Recently, he and his collaborators, most of whom I think were experimental physicists, published an amazing result in which they created a macroscopic superposition state in which they created a superposition state involving a living being, a kind of tiny little bug called a tardigrade. And we will discuss that experiment in some detail and also talk about the implications of this experimental accomplishment for things like the foundations of quantum mechanics, quantum information, and quantum computing. So welcome to the podcast, Vladko. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Yes, I'm really glad I could get you. And it's just amazing because I, I've been waiting, anticipating this kind of experimental result for many, many years, and I, I'm glad you guys finally accomplished it. And now through the magic of the internet and podcasting, I can just interview you and share the conversation with, you know, perhaps thousands of listeners. I'm, I'm very happy. And I think um, it is a very exciting result for me to speak about. You're right that it's an old idea in some sense, and it's taken a long time to, to realize. And also I'm excited about the future, you know, how we can extrapolate this experiment and what else we can do with it. Great. We're going to get into all this stuff. And um, let me warn the audience that, you know, I'm a theorist and you're also a theorist, although probably now, by now, you know a lot about the details of the experiment. But of course, in physics, the real work is done by experimentalists who have to really do things in the in the lab and, and make things happen. So it's easy for theorists to conjecture something or imagine something, but those guys have to do the heavy lifting to actually make it happen. Yes, definitely. Actually, all the credit goes to my colleagues in, in Singapore, in fact, who managed to achieve this uh, amazing result. Great. We're going to get into all of that, but let's start with your background because I, I think the listeners always enjoy hearing about the intellectual odyssey that uh, each scientist goes through in their career. So you are originally from, am I correct, Croatia? Uh, Serbia, actually. From Serbia, Serbia. Right? <laughs> that was from, a huge mistake, wasn't it? You know, well, not a huge mistake uh, um, uh, geographically. Um, I think we are talking about. Um, couple of hundred kilometers maybe away from Croatia and um, so Belgrade the capital of Serbia and I went to school there as well so I was in Serbia up until I was about 19 I think 18 19 and I think what influenced me was probably my high school uh, intellectually speaking, that was the greatest influence. And it's, I think, around about the age of 15, 16, when I really started to get into physics. I think it was maybe at that time for the first time taught properly, as it were, and at a, at a level that, that could um, actually be exciting for a teenager. And I think that grabbed me around about that time. I thought this was really mind blowing. And, and maybe that was the beginning of, uh, of all of it for me. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I think it was during my teen years where I realized just how amazing uh, the concepts in physics were. And uh, I just couldn't uh, get enough of it, actually. Yes, yes. I think uh, lots of us physicists feel very similarly about it, that, that there is a feeling that's very different. I mean, it's difficult to describe in a way why we feel this way. Uh, but even, you know, even the simplest concepts in physics, it's just mind blowing that you can, you can actually uh, make predictions about all sorts of things uh, that at first sight look complex, but somehow you can write a few lines on a piece of paper, calculate things, and actually, then you can do an experiment and really confirm that. I, I found that mind-blowing. It's magical. I, I still find it like that. Yeah, I agree. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, I believe both your undergraduate degree and your PhD are from Imperial College in London. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. It was, it was a, a kind of a, almost an accident, actually, that a, a cousin of mine who... I think lived in London at the time, actually, I think since maybe the, the 70s, actually. I think she moved from, from Serbia to, uh, 
to England when she was young as well. She actually was uh, was married to um, a person who himself had a PhD from Imperial. And it's just by talking to him, uh, I was talking to him about my passion for uh, for physics at that time. I think he was a biochemist and he was a PhD from uh, from Imperial himself. And And actually he said to me, if you like physics so much, why don't you come and study at Imperial? And, and he told me about um, um, all of the great researchers that he was aware of and, and the fact that they had, I think, five Nobel laureates in physics and all of these things. And he made it really sound very exciting for, for me, which is actually what determined my choice. That's how I applied to come to, to Imperial. And then, as you said, it was natural after my undergraduate degree to actually stay on and do a PhD. Um, I, I had a brief uh, stint at Oxford in between, and I nearly actually went to do my PhD uh, at Oxford. I had an offer from Oxford, but somehow it seemed to me uh, better to, to continue at Imperial at that time. Now, this was the 90s, is that correct? This was the 90s, yeah, all in the 90s. I see. So that the, in my field, the, uh, maybe the best-known guy at Imperial, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is Tom Kibble. Are you, are you fantastic familiar? guy, fantastic guy. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think he, he was inspirational, actually. Um, and, uh, and you're right. I think he comes from that. Um, I think that's a group, uh, the group of physicists who actually made Imperial famous. People like, uh, of course, Abdul Salam. I think he may have even started the theory department at Imperial. Uh, then Chris Isham. I think who was one of Salam's students, Tom Keeble, certainly uh, that generation of people. And I think th th they really achieved a kind of um, a world uh, renowned um, uh, research at, at that time. Um, and it certainly was impressive to be, I think even though you were doing, of course, your undergraduate degree and you're not directly involved with research, I think you're still fully aware of what's going on around. And I think Imperial has, has certainly been an impressive place. Yes. Yeah, so in the nineties, I'm guessing that, so quantum information wasn't already a big thing. So perhaps were you studying quantum optics for your PhD? Uh, that's a, that's a great uh, question actually, because it was, you're, you're right. I was somehow extremely lucky uh, that in my last undergraduate year, what happened is that I think uh, this was 94, so Shaw, Peter Shaw published his uh, famous algorithm. Now, Shaw's algorithm for factorization of numbers um, uh, on a quantum computer. So this was really the first piece of evidence uh, that a quantum computer could actually do something exponentially more uh, efficiently than any classical computer. This influenced me a great deal in my last year, because in your last year, of course, you kind of tend to get a bit more into research. You do a, an extended project. And my project was really on entanglement between photons and atoms. So that, that's something that I actually started with, and, and it's kind of kept me intrigued over a long period of time. I was lucky at that time. It was quantum optics, you're right. And my, my, my supervisor ultimately was Peter Knight, actually, who, who is a quantum optician. But I was very lucky uh, to meet through him, Arthur Eckert, uh, who actually shortly before meeting him, he had developed entanglement-based quantum cryptography. And through him, I met David Deutsch. And at that time, that was more or less the kind of quantum computing community in, in, in the UK. That's how small it was. And so I was very lucky at that time that, that the field had just started to kind of become uh, extremely interesting. And, and of course, there was this huge promise of, uh, of uh, exponential efficiency. Now, now, those guys that you mentioned, are, are they not Oxford people? Eckerd and... Uh, uh, Oxford people, yes. I, yeah. think, I think Imperial and Oxford uh, have had a kind of uh, a long-standing collaboration in, in many directions. And I think Arthur Reckert was formerly at Oxford, but I think he would spend almost like one day a week at Imperial as well. So somehow we felt like, like a very, a very small family at that time. I, you know, when I met David Deutsch, uh, 
I, I, I came to Oxford. I think I, I just, uh, I was finishing my undergraduate degree. And, and I think David gave me three or four papers to read on quantum computing. And it was interesting. Uh, it took me a bit of time to read them. I came back to him and I said, David, I read the papers. What do I do now? And, and he said to me, now you are an international um, expert on quantum computing. And it was very funny, you know, to a 22, three year old myself to hear. That's how small the whole field was. And, and I found it uh, immediately extremely exciting. All sorts of aspects, both physics and the computational side as well. That's an amazing story. So I, I, I'm older than you, so I missed this boat. And uh, I remember when Shore's result came out, I was just transitioning from postdoc at Harvard to assistant professorship at Yale. And at the time, I was spending a fair amount of time talking physics with a guy called Eddie Farhi at MIT. Yes. And uh, I remember discussing Shor's algorithm with him and, and actually trying to come up with other interesting things to do. And I think Seth Lloyd wrote his paper on quantum simulation right around yes. that time. Yes, that was, a, that was a big thing as well. You, you almost, on a, on a weekly basis, you had a new proposal for how to implement qubits and gates, and it was extremely exciting. It was clear that experimentalists were starting to get into it and, and take it more seriously. It, it, it felt, already at that time, it felt like a field that was definitely going to explode. Yeah, I think I missed the boat because I, I sort of stayed more focused in uh, kind of particle physics and cosmology. Yes. But are still very exciting, yes. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was an undergrad at Caltech, Feynman was teaching a class called Physical Limits to Computation. Yes. And, um, you know, which was secretly a kind of a course about quantum computing well before its time. And I remember saying to my dad, he, my dad asked me, oh, what, what's Feynman doing? Why aren't you taking a class from Feynman? And I said, well, he's teaching this weird stuff. He's not teaching, you know, I, I would have been very happy to, to take a course with him on path integrals or, or yes. particle physics. Or, I said, well, he's doing this weird stuff. It doesn't even seem to be physics. And that's how stupid <laughs> I was as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very unusual. Uh, I think that's um, the course you attended. Uh, it, it probably came out as a book later. The, yes. There was a beautiful book by Feynman. Yes. Uh, w which sounds, as you said, like a weird mixture of kind of solid state physics and computing logic as well. It, it's very unusual. Yeah. But he, he was thinking through all these things at the time. And yes. now, we, now we really appreciate the, the fundamental nature of these questions. Uh, Deutsch was also very early in understanding these things. Um, yes, I think two of them probably um, made the biggest contribution. You are right. Uh, I think the idea comes from Feynman and then somehow this idea that you can actually uh, make a universal quantum computer uh, and you can kind of offer this blueprint through gates and qubits comes from Deutsch. And I, I, I think it's, uh, it's really why the whole thing took off ultimately. Yes. When I was in, in this phase, when I first moved to Yale, I remember going down to the library and I found some, I, I forgot what the journal is. It's some British journal where his, uh, his papers on the church Turing thesis, yes. quantum computer. I, I remember reading these things and it was very mind blowing to me because it was totally different from the kind of focus of most, you know, particle physicists or quantum field theorists, just totally different. Yes, I, I think it is very different. And traditionally, as a physicist, you don't really learn these things in your undergraduate degree. You know, you don't talk about logic. You don't talk about information theory almost at all. I was lucky to, again, going back to my high school, you know, I was lucky that I had some kind of rudimentary understanding of logic, mathematical logic. So I did a little bit of that as part of my own maths. And, and maybe that's what made it a little bit less unusual when I was reading these papers. But I think otherwise you are right. It's, um, uh, it, it's very, very kind of unorthodox for a physicist. Yeah. You know, I, in high school, I had read this book called Gödel Escher Bach. Yes. And, uh, so I was familiar with Turing's work and, uh, Gödel's theorem. So I was quite interested in that stuff, but, uh, I had sort of made a conscious choice to do, do something you know, do physics instead of doing that stuff. So it was a kind of mind boggling that quantum mechanics could possibly be connected to these concepts. Yes. Um, I just want to say one other thing, which, and get your reaction to this. So there's another thread here, which is that 
there's a bunch of people who come more from particle theory, string theory, gravity, who spend a lot of time thinking about the quantum mechanics of black holes. So whether information is destroyed by black holes and, you know, the, the evaporation of black holes destroys unitarity. And so from the group of people that I know well, a lot of the awareness of the concepts in quantum information theory and things like that came from, believe it or not, from being interested in the physics of black holes. Yes. And yes, I don't know they... if that's apparent to people on the other side, like to a guy who does quantum optics, you know, this, somebody coming to them saying, oh, I got interested in your subject because of black holes. It just sounds totally crazy. No, no, I, I think uh, not at all, actually, because I think um, even certainly myself at that time, but I, I would say even my colleagues around me, we were definitely aware of, uh, of Bekenstein's work, right, on, 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 mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the information. And I think, that, you know, this area where you have thermodynamics, information theory, quantum physics, I think it's a very rich area. Uh, and certainly most of us were even at that time aware of, of uh, lots of this work in that direction. And I think it's a nat you know, natural connection between thermodynamics, I would say, and, and information theory. It's a fascinating work. And then you mentioned Seth Lloyd, of course, he's had these speculations and, and in fact, doing um, a simple calculation on, on thinking of a black hole as, as the kind of ultimate computer, you know, and how much, how many quantum bits can you store in, in, in a black hole and, and how quickly can you actually execute the gates? Yep. I think those are fascinating questions, but more fascinating probably is what you brought up, which is actually uh, the physics side of things. You know, it's a place where quantum physics and gravity kind of meet equally strongly. And then, of course, there is this fundamental debate, you know, which one wins and, and what do we do in this domain? Uh, and, and will there be, I guess, string theory center there advocating that there will be maybe a theory that supersedes both and, 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 you know, gravity and quantum mechanics become somehow special cases of this possibly. So, so it's, it's still a, a very exciting direction. Yes. Actually, I hope at the end of our conversation to come back to maybe some of these uh, ideas, but maybe we should just get into the experiment so the audience uh, can get a better feel for it. So maybe in your own words, just tell us maybe the history of this experiment. Like how did you get involved? What were the motivations for it? And then ultimately what was accomplished? Uh, yes, I think the, like I mentioned, the idea really is, I, I would say like most of these quantum experiments, they really go back to, uh, this thought experiment of Schrodinger's and in fact. One could even say that all quantum experiments are really more or less complicated versions of Schrodinger's idea. So Schrodinger had this idea that if you have a, uh, an object in a quantum superposition, you know, if you have an, an atom that's either decayed, emitted a photon or not emitted a photon and, and quantumly this exists at the same time. He then thought that anything else that couples to this entity would have to somehow join into this superposition. So, of course, as we know, Schrodinger had this bottle of poison that if the atom decays, breaks the bottle. And then there was the famous cat that gets, you know, poisoned. But in the other branch of the superposition, the atom has not decayed and, and nothing happens to the poison. It doesn't get released and the cat is, is perfectly happy and alive and, uh, and, and all is fine. So th the point that Schrodinger was making is um, if you take quantum mechanics seriously, and, and I think at that time, you know, this was 1935, the way he wrote this is almost in a, in a way that he was exposing an apparent paradox. So I think if you read that paper in 1935, you would think that Schrodinger probably thought that it, this would not go like this. However, I think even he changed his mind. And I think towards the end of his life in the 50s, if you read his uh, writing at that time, it seems to me he perfectly acknowledged that, that this kind of um, entangled state would be possible in principle. And in fact, I think he advocated this as the most consistent view of quantum mechanics. 
So, so the, the idea is always, if you have a simple object in a superposition, and if this object somehow interacts with another object, then that other object also has to become part of that superposition. Unless, of course, something happens that's different to quantum mechanics and that would prevent this superposition. So what Schrodinger was actually offering is also a, a test of quantum mechanics um, in, in a way. My own interest, so, so that's kind of the experiment that I think captures a lot of these things. And like I said, probably at the time when Schrodinger was talking about this, this was probably considered science fiction uh, more than a, a, a realistic possibility. But I think with time, as the technology really improved, uh, for me, I think the, the transition was at the end of the 90s. I think throughout the 90s, most of the experiments that were done in the quantum optics labs were maybe entangling two photons, maybe the internal degrees of freedom of photons, maybe uh, path, maybe frequency. Maybe you could entangle a couple of atoms. Maybe you'd be entangling photons with atoms, but it was always at the level of a couple of particles and not more. That was the kind of the state of the art at the beginning of the field. However, round about the year 2000, just at the beginning of the new millennium, people in the solid state, in the many body uh, physics direction, started to take quantum computing and quantum information more seriously. And I think this was a game changer. This really was because I think most of us now started to think, well, maybe, maybe this quantum entanglement phenomenon could actually manifest itself in the macroscopic domain. And, and in fact, uh, as you know, the, the, the leading current technologies for qubits are really superconducting qubits, they are in the macroscopic domain and they were crucial for the experiment that we are discussing here. So uh, I think that started to develop round about the year 2000 onwards. In fact, it's an interesting anecdote that I think many people before that time would even be betting that you couldn't make a qubit out of a superconductor, that you couldn't control all the relevant superpositions appropriately to make it into a full-fledged qubit. And then I think 99, 2000 people started to do exactly that. And I think that's, that was crucial, I would say, for this kind of experiment. So just to back up a little for the audience, uh, and uh, I think you're, 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 you're describing things at just the right level, but there are many listeners to the podcast who aren't actually physicists. So we should, yes. I, I'm going to back up a little and just explain things to them. So a unique aspect of quantum mechanics is this idea of an entangled state or a superposition state where to take the simplest case, maybe you have the spin of an electron. Maybe it can have a spin pointed in the up direction and spin directed in the down direction. And somehow in quantum mechanics, you can make a state where it's in a sense simultaneously in both the up and down state in, in a very specific way. And the, the period that Vodka was talking about, the early 90, late 90s, we were already pretty experienced with making superposition states out of really simple elementary degrees of freedom, like the spin of an electron or the photon polarization. But it was still then an open question whether you could take a macroscopic system, a system with many degrees of freedom, and place it in a superposition state. And I think Vladko just told us that already the qubits, some of the most promising qubits that might be used in the future for quantum computers are themselves macroscopic superposition states. So these superconducting qubits involve, correct me if I'm wrong, Gladko, they, they involve, for example, the circulation of charges in some yes. kind of superconductor. And so you could have a superposition between charges are circulating clockwise and charges are circulating counterclockwise in some kind of um, superconducting system. Yes, I, I think that's, that was the key. Uh, difference, exactly as you described it, that prior to that, uh, you would maybe entangle two spins of two different electrons or two different nuclei of atoms, or you would entangle two photons uh, when, when, you know, polarization would now be the relevant degree of freedom. It's kind of like the spin of 
of a photon, uh, but no one did anything um, more impressive than that. Uh, with superconductors, of course, we are talking one qubit is the one you described where you have a whole current uh, moving in two different directions, clockwise and counterclockwise simultaneously. Or you could think about two tiny islands uh, of this superconductor and you could think about different numbers of electrons existing on these two islands, which is also kind of like a more macroscopic property than anything before that. Uh, and I think this was crucial because, like I said, there were actually skeptics before that, physicists who would uh, think that, that, that nothing like this could even be achieved. And, and I think this technology, you know, proved to be crucial at that time. So, so those systems that you just described, the islands or the rotating charges, um, th those are, they involve many degrees of freedom, say, for example, millions of degrees of freedom but they're not yet living creatures. That's right. Um, and, you know, part of Schrodinger's original thought experiment was the ultimate thing that gets put into the superposition state is a cat, or maybe even the experimentalist yes. who looks in at the cat. So th that's <laughs> going, you know, to the ultimate uh, yes. question. But already there was resistance by people saying that, okay, if it's got a million degrees of freedom, you will not be able to put it in a superposition state, even if it's just some electrons. Yes. Uh, I think the uh, the main resistance actually in the early days, it's interesting that you mentioned this point, came from uh, Niels Bohr himself. Uh, Niels Bohr, uh, according to many people, is, is uh, almost one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, actually. Uh, however, he thought um, uh, that there is a certain kind of complementarity uh, between being alive and even being quantum. So he thought about kind of quantum effects in chemistry being important, of course, for many natural processes. However, on the other hand, biology also relies on all sorts of organizational complexities as well that are relevant for any living system. And he, in 1930s actually, may, maybe around about the time of Schrodinger, was already speculating that you could actually experiment with a living system, but you may be able to only probe biological features. You will never be able to probe the kind of quantum chemical features that are relevant for, for living systems. So there were all sorts of ideas out there that living systems, if anything, may even collapse quantum effects. They, they may reduce quantum phenomena ultimately to some kind of classical physics. Uh, and I think these views started in the early days of quantum mechanics and, you know, they have persisted. In fact, even now, we have some people who believe that maybe living systems should ultimately somehow change the underlying physics. So for us, this was really the key motivation to show that actually um, probably this is not correct. And I think there is no contradiction between having a full kind of quantum behavior and, and uh, being alive. Good. So you use the word collapse. And so let, let me just uh, jump in there and say the question of whether I could put some macroscopic system into a superposition state is sort of dual to the question of whether that macroscopic system can quote collapse wave functions. Because if the macroscopic system collapses the wave function, it will stop the process of it, it itself being forced into a superposition state. So there, there's sort of dual versions of the same question, yes. i.e. whether macroscopic systems can be placed into superposition states. Yes. And, and, and sorry, just to finish the thought. So, so the already just in our little story here, already by the late nineties, it was becoming or early two thousands, it was becoming clear that just having a large number of degrees of freedom would not automatically make you into a wave function collapsing system. Uh, at least some examples of macroscopic systems with millions of degrees of freedom could actually be placed in superposition states. Yes, and I think that was really uh, very important. Um, certainly one thing to immediately add to that is that it does become more and more complicated to maintain these superpositions and these large entangled states. 
And this is simply because you have to really keep track of all the relevant degrees of freedom. You, you kind of, what you don't want to happen is that bits of the environment that you don't control properly somehow start to interact with your superposition, uh, in which case this would effectively for all purposes be like a noise, classical noise that can disrupt, of course, quantum superposition. And the more degrees of freedom you have, the more ways in which something can also be disrupted exist. And, and that's actually the key challenge for all of the experiments that we are discussing in this direction. So let's, let's focus in on the bug for a second. So yes. it's called a tardigrade and it's a fraction of a millimeter in size and it can survive being cooled to super low temperatures so that you can isolate it from thermal effects in the environment. Yes. Uh, and so a good candidate system perhaps for uh, a living being, although in a sense that the, the state that it was in when you did your experiment, it was kind of dormant, but, but then it was, it was brought back to life after the experiment. Yes. This thing then is a good candidate system because it's macroscopic, but it can be brought to a very low temperature and then isolated from the environment around it. Yes. That's uh, again, um, the key feature and, and why we chose this particular system, as you said, it's, it's incredibly robust. Uh, in, in fact, um, I think biologists don't really understand yet properly how tardigrades manage to achieve this uh, state of, of kind of suspended animation. You know, they, they almost switch off all of their relevant functions, biological functions, and they go into this state of dormant state, as you said, the state of TUN, I think, T-U-N, as it's known formally by biologists. They expel all water, of course, so they make sure that they really can withstand these extreme external conditions like low temperature and low pressure. Um, what was interesting to us, by the way, is that the temperatures that were relevant to us because the experiment was done uh, with superconducting quantum bits, for these qubits to operate as qubits, they really have to be at very low temperatures. And when I say low, we are talking about um, 10 uh, millikelvin, between one and 10 millikelvin. So, uh, you know, this is something that's almost a million times lower than the room temperature. Th these are very fancy cryogenics, very fancy fridges, if you like, informally speaking, they actually get you to this very low temperature. So we were looking for a living system that could withstand that, uh, but biologists didn't know whether they could withstand anything as low as that. Any experiments before that uh, were things like blasting them off on a rocket <laughs> into, uh, into outer space. And I think uh, they, they in fact were completely okay with these conditions, but now we're talking about, you know, uh, roughly three Kelvin background temperature. So this is about a thousand times higher than anything that we did in our experiment. So we didn't know whether we could really uh, get them to temperatures as low as this. Of course, you know, evolutionary speaking, there is absolutely no reason why they should have this ability. You know, that, that's still one big mystery. Very low temperatures and very low pressures as well. We are talking about pressures that are about comparably million times lower than, uh, than the atmospheric pressure that, that, that we kind of normally live with. So, so it's very interesting that the tardigrade went into this state of TAN under these extreme conditions. And then, as you said, when the experiment was completed, we could actually just put the tardigrade back into water and watch it revive and, and go about its own business. You know, that was very interesting to see. Yeah. So obviously we don't know of any reason why evolution would have quote over-engineered this guy to be yes. even more robust than any, mm -hmm. any environment that could ever experience in the natural yes. world. Yes. Um, uh, but let's, let's go back to the actual, uh, experiment. So for the audience to visualize it, you have an apparatus where you have two superconducting qubits, let's call them qubit A and qubit B, 
The whole thing is at super low temperature. Yes. You sort of place the tardigrade in between the two, right? Yeah. Yes. I think what you need to do, um, 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 this, um, each qubit is a bit like a, a tiny electrical circuit. Maybe that's the best way to, to describe it at this level. And what you do have is you have a capacitor there. So you, you, you have two plates which are facing each other and which can periodically become charged and discharged due to the movement of the charges inside this circuit. And what we did is place the tardigrade exactly in the gap between these two plates. And the gap actually, if you look at it, almost perfectly matches the size of the, of the tardigrade. I think the size was about half a millimeter. And, and, and that's exactly, it, it was lucky that that fits this gap between the capacitor plates. Great. And, and I mean, so some of the reaction to the experiment when your paper came out, I remember there were some people who were skeptical saying, well, how do they know they really put the tardigrade itself into a superposition state? You know, oh, actually all they did was modify the dielectric constant of the material in between the capacitor plates. And we don't know really what happened inside the tardigrade. So yes. maybe, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yes, I'd love to talk about it because, of course, there are various degrees uh, of confidence that you can have in these experiments. And certainly, one has to bear in mind that these are the first steps in that direction. So I think the experiments could really be improved. And I can actually comment on, on what we could do and what we are planning to do in, in, in that direction. Um, I think... The idea, the idea is really to explain the mechanism by which the tardigrade gets entangled to the qubit. So what happens in a qubit, as we said, is that you have this charge that exists in the qubit, which actually exists in two different places at the same time. So it's, it's very similar to, in some sense, uh, to the Schrodinger cat where you have this atom that's in two different states of having decayed and not decayed. Here you have two different states where charge exists in one place and in another place simultaneously in, in, in this quantum superposition. And, and now what you do is you actually introduce the tardigrade there, which then has to somehow respond to this ambiguous, if you like, quantumly ambiguous state of the charge. And what quantum mechanics says to us is that this generates two different states inside the tardigrade, two different charges, charge states inside of the molecules inside the tardigrade, such that when the qubit is in one state of charge, the tardigrade is in, in one corresponding internal state. And if the qubit is in the other state, the tardigrade follows and it's in, in another internal molecular state. So it's not quite dead and alive, if you like. It's not quite Schrodinger's cat. It doesn't respond as extremely as that. But what it means really is that the macroscopic state of charges inside the tardigrade, inside this living animal, have to respond in two different ways simultaneously to the superposed state of the qubit. And that actually quantum mechanically means that they become entangled. So now this is, get, this is getting into just some details that I think only physicists would appreciate. But so it looked like in your paper, the model for the tardigrade for this specific calculation was some kind of big sum over dipoles. Is that right? Yes. And yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. It's, it's really, um, you can think of even this qubit uh, and the superposed charge as some kind of induced dipole, which then further induces a response of probably many dipoles. In fact, this this is one of the one of the things that I mentioned we would like to do in the future is to understand better the exact extent of these dipoles inside the tardigrade. That's something we don't understand well to the degree that we don't even understand how many dipoles exactly are involved. We don't understand the frequencies of these oscillations properly and so on. So I think that, that there is a lot of details that we would love to be able to understand to improve our model. 
Yes. But yes, it was sufficient just to do an ordinary, simple dipole dipole coupling. Yeah. So I, at an abstract level, I could fully accept your calculation because I would just, I, I, I was thinking, well, okay, if the, if the qubit is in a different charge state, surely there is some reaction from the, you know, yes. the degrees of freedom in the tardigrade. And so if, if the, the, the charges are in a superposition state, then the, then the actual guts of the uh, tardigrade are likely to end up in a super, corresponding superposition state of which maybe we don't know the full details. Yes. Then when I saw your, your sum over dipoles, I was thinking maybe these guys actually know something about the specific degrees of freedom. Like what, what are the, are these specific molecules inside the tardigrade or are they only effective degrees of freedom inside? The, so that part, I didn't really understand. From your no. Opinion. And I think, uh, I think it's a great question and, and we don't understand that well in, um, in a similar experiment that, that we did on a bacterium a while back, maybe some five years ago, we had a better understanding because a bacterium is a simpler organism. And this particular one has been studied extensively because of its ability to do photosynthesis. So I could tell you a little bit more about the energy level structures. I could even comment on exactly what kind of dipoles we are talking about, what kind of vibrations get involved into in this dynamics. But I think with a tardigrade, we, we don't have that understanding. So you're, you're right. This would be a key, a key question because it would also tell us how microscopic this superposition ultimately is, you know, what fraction of the tardigrade really does participate in this entangled state. Yeah. I, well, in, in, again, like I'm not an expert on any of this, but as I was thinking about it, I was reading your paper, I thought, well, surely whatever this dipole reaction in the tardigrade is it's some collective mode and involves lots of you know individual yes. electrons inside so so it, it is macroscopic in some sense it can't avoid being macroscopic in some sense i think i think so and i think that's how we think about it again this would be another suggestion for uh, for really further experiments uh, is that if you really want to uh, demonstrate conclusively beyond reasonable doubt that two systems are entangled what we tend to do in, in the field is to separate these two systems and to make measurements which are done independently on one of them, on each of them, without affecting the other system. So they're kind of done locally, close to the vicinity of where the system is, uh, and independently of the other system. And then somehow these measurements are jointly analyzed to conclude whether the state, the joint state is entangled or not. Here in this experiment, uh, we were not able to do that because the tardigrade forms almost like a very tightly bound hybrid qubit with the qubit itself, with the superconducting qubit. And it's simply not feasible experimentally to make a separate measurement on the tardigrade to the measurements that you do on the superconducting qubit. But I think. If we were to improve our experiments and develop them more, this would be the direction I would like to go into, to really probe more extensively the degrees of freedom of the tardigrade and to try to separate them somehow from the qubit and measure them independently. Yes. So I, I think if people criticized your experiment and just said, well, we'd like it better if they could take this last step, I think that's totally reasonable. It's but reasonable. I, I thought I saw comments, maybe it's because I was looking on that terrible place called Twitter, but, but <laughs> I thought I saw comments where people just doubted that you had even made a macroscopic superposition state. And for me, reading your paper, it seems like that, that's probably the most likely thing that happened, not, not the, even though you don't know all the details of it. Of course. I think of it like that too. And, and maybe another exciting thing to add, and, and you mentioned it briefly at the beginning, there was another qubit involved. Uh, and so. If you want to demonstrate that something is really a bona fide quantum system, then the ultimate test is whether you can really entangle that system to another genuine quantum system. So on the one hand, we have this tardigrade inside one of the qubits forming this kind of hybrid macroscopic superposition. And then you have this extra superconducting qubit that now gets entangled to this first hybrid qubit. And in fact, the experiment verified 
with a very high fidelity that this state was entangled. And in fact, I think they created all sorts of different entangled states. They, they demonstrated that you can do the full range of superpositions. So to me, I think this interpretation that it is a macroscopic superposition also seems um, much more likely than anything else. Right. Now, I, let, let's um, maybe fast forward and just to say 10 years go by and we're meeting again in, in some pub at Oxford or something. And, you know, I say, well, congratulations, Vladko, you guys did this and this with uh, bacterium and you did this with uh, another tardigrade system. Surely now no one can doubt that biological systems, i.e. these examples we just quoted, can be placed into a superposition state. Yes. And furthermore, that means that in the kind of Borean, from the Borean perspective, there are not things which automatically, quote, cause the wave function to collapse. It seems like that's where, you know, assuming that these experiments go the way we think they would go, the, the field collectively physicists should come to that conclusion. Do you, do you think that's what will happen? I, I, I think so. I think, uh, maybe the, the key thing will be to really try to do this with, um, two or more living systems. Uh, but it seems to me, if you really demonstrate entanglement at that level, uh, that, uh, then it, it is clearly beyond, beyond reasonable doubt that, um, that there is no complementarity. There's certainly no conflict as Bo would put it between being alive and being, being in a superposition, being fully quantum mechanical. I, I think that must be the conclusion. Right. And so I, I think for us, you know, lazy theorists who just lie on our backs and think about things, but we don't have to actually build the experiments. We, you know, for us, it just seems obvious. This is where it's heading, right? That, um, yes. And I agree with you. I think quantum mechanics has been going more and more into the, into the macro domain really. And we're identifying more f phenomena where we can actually uh, not just create entanglement, but then detect it, manipulate it reliably. And, and I agree with you that, that this will probably characterize the next uh, decade or so of, 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 of our experimental uh, kind of efforts. You know, I, I often meet experimentalists who, you know, they're busy doing real stuff, so they don't have time to think about, you know, I don't, I hate to use the word philosophy, but quasi philosophical yes. aspects of quantum mechanics. And so they, they might, I might say to them, well, do you think we'll, do you think that, uh, we'll ever put a human in a superposition state? And they might say yes, or they might say no. And I say, is it possible you're in a superposition state right now? And, you know, they might say yes, they might say no. But then I ask them, well, will you be able to build a quantum computer with, uh, you know, uh, 10 million qubits and that thing will be in a very complex superposition state, they say, of course, yes, eventually we're going to do that, right? Yes. So there doesn't seem to be a, you know, they don't seem to, to me, there's a very strong dichotomy there because if I, if I believe in AI and I think, oh, you could implement some AI algorithm inside your quantum computer in the future, you've effectively made a brain, which could be put in a superposition state, right? And, yes. And it's, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, it's very nice that you mentioned this. I, I love this topic, actually, that, that you just started, because um, it seems to me, in, in coming back to Schrodinger, uh, that the most exciting thing would really be to put not a cat into this experiment, but either a human or an AI. Uh, and the reason for that is that what you really want to probe is whether this entity feels any different when they become superposed, when they join this entangled state. And I think, you know, we are not really able, sadly, to communicate very faithfully with, with animals. Otherwise, of course, a cat could do if you could ask um, the cat a few questions and, uh, and, and get a response. But I think um, before we do it with a human, because with a human, again, the complexity is enormous. It seems to me that the best bet is to have maybe a quantum computer with, you know, maybe even a hundred thousand or a million qubits that actually simulates artificial intelligence and really subject this entity to some kind of superposition and then try to interact with it to show uh, that there is no ambiguity there whatsoever. And it's possible that this entity really exists in both branches of the superposition and in each of these branches, it feels just as, as we feel when we see things very clearly. So I, I think this to me would be a fantastic uh, 
um, experiment to try to perform. Yes, I think that's that's where things are going. And of course, if they make a general purpose quantum computer of extremely high complexity, uh, then obviously it, it could also implement classical machine learning AI type uh, algorithms. And so we, we should be able to make a superposition state of a thing which does machine learning or does some kind of AI like uh, information processing. So yeah, I think I think that's where things are going to go. In in the blog post I wrote after I read your paper, I I referenced a very old funny story that a, a theorist named Sidney Coleman. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he he was yes. a particle theorist at Harvard who mainly did work in things like quantum field theory. But he did think a little bit about quantum foundations. And toward the end of his career, he used to give this talk called "Quantum Mechanics in Your Face." where yes. he would really try to convey to the audience the visceral strangeness of quantum mechanics. Yes. And one of the little stories he tells is about Gork the robot. So there's a robot, which is an AI that works for the experimentalists in the lab. And then Sidney makes this little joke. He says, well, of course, Gork is just a robot. He doesn't collapse wave functions. So <laughs> uh, he can be put into a superposition state. And, you know, so he can look in at the output of the experiment without collapsing the wave function. And then it's only when he reports back to his master, the experimentalist, that the wave function collapses. Yes. And, and this little story is sort of a retelling of, I think, what, what people call Wigner's friend yes. uh, in Quantum Foundation. So, so Sidney was just kind of recasting in this kind of science fiction setting. But it just shows you how absurd the whole thing is. Like if, if I implement Gork inside a quantum computer, Surely Gork has to split into different superposition states, right? I, I, I would think so. I think it's an inevitable uh, conclusion if you really take quantum mechanics seriously and if you really apply it to that level of complexity. You know, you're effectively treating everything in the universe as being quantum uh, mechanical. I think Br Bryce DeWitt had a had a had an interesting phrase which he, he would call it quantum totalitarian property <laughs> yes. david deutsch told me that and it's precisely totalitarian in, in in this respect that anything that interacts with a superposition must become superposed in exactly this way so there is no way out i mean to be to be fair of course to to uh to people who uh, believe in 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 possibly different interpretations it is possible that we will find something interesting when we do these experiments with more complex entities, maybe with, you know, with, with uh, human beings, with artificial intelligence. It is possible that we are missing some ingredients uh, that are important uh, to, let's say, thinking or perception or consciousness, or I think this is all wide open. But at the moment, if you ask me to bet on it, I would fully agree with with what you are saying that somehow there is no reason why this this thing should not just behave exactly the quantum mechanical way as as we are discussing. Yes, I think Hawking used to say maybe he has the pithiest formulation. He says, "If quantum mechanics applies to every degree of freedom in the universe, then many worlds follows trivially." I think yes, I think that's a quote from Hawking. So, but it's still highly controversial in our field and. I would say in, in the part of the physics community that I'm in, which is, you know, cosmologists, people who do quantum gravity, string theory, I would say the majority of people would place their bet. They might not say I'm hundred percent or 99% confident, but they would place their bet on this kind of to quantum totalitarian or, or many yes. worlds kind of view. But whenever I go to a conference in your part of the world, in your part of the field, yes. I find people are much more guarded, maybe because they're closer to the action, but, uh, people are much at least in my experience, much less likely to say, okay, I, I either believe this or I don't believe this. So uh, what, what do you think? Yes, I think with cosmology, it's, it's clear, as you said, because we think of the universe as a, as a closed system. And then the only way consistently to treat it as such is really to apply uh, quantum mechanics to all the degrees of freedom in the universe. I think when you go the other end, you know, into atomic physics, the people who do experiments with these tiny objects for them what is relevant is of course uh, the rest of the laboratory which frequently for all practical purposes can be treated completely classically so i think i guess they are not they haven't made up their mind simply because you could in your model 
account for all of your results frequently by thinking of the large part of your uh, laboratory, all of the equipment really classically. You don't really have to quantize that if you like. However, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that these things are not quantum because after all, classical physics is just a very special case of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, of course, reproduces the full classical behavior in some very special limit. So, the, you know, these two views are not even contradicting one another. It's just, it seems to me, people who do atomic physics, quantum optics, sub subatomic, they're frequently more reserved simply because we haven't tested larger and larger systems. But I think we're going in that direction. And I think the opinions will change uh, with these uh, more complex experiments. Yeah, I, 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 I'm really looking forward to that. I, I think that it, it's really a matter of just our technological capabilities. And if you and your collaborators continue to succeed uh, with these constructing these more and more complex uh, superposition states, then I think gradually, maybe it'll start with younger physicists, but but at some point people will realize, hey, the, the, the implication is very strong here now. So we, yes. we, probably, we probably do live in a quantum multiverse or some, some, something with lots of entanglement, uh, even at a macroscopic level. Yes, I fully agree. I think it's the, it's the most consistent picture. It's certainly consistent with everything we've observed. And, and even theoretically, you know, frequently mixing classical and quantum physics actually fails to address all sorts of other issues. It's simply logically inconsistent, actually. So, so somehow I think ultimately we will acknowledge that, that everything has to be treated quantum mechanically. Yeah, I would say that, again, this is my own opinion and not everybody agrees with me, but in my own study of quantum foundations, the, the only version that I can really formulate in a logically consistent way, in a full way, is the many worlds interpretation. And the other ones all have problems, <laughs> logical yes. problems. So yes. it doesn't mean many worlds is correct, but... Uh, I agree. I agree. Is... I, I, yeah, I agree. I think my guess would be that if something really happens with quantum mechanics to the extent that we have to modify it, then it's going to be similar to what happened with classical physics. Namely, whatever supersedes quantum mechanics will be something even more complex. I think then quantum mechanics will become like a special case of this more general theory. But I think it's exceedingly unlikely that we're going to go back to classical physics. I think whatever comes next will be somehow even more correlated and entangled in some sense rather than a return to, to the classical world. Yes, I, I think you're right. You know, there, there are ideas out there involving quantum gravity and things like this, which yes. maybe supersede quantum mechanics, but it's very hard. Again, now we're getting into a slightly technical discussion that maybe only theorists would like to hear, but it's very tough to deviate from linearity a little bit. So it turns out if you, if you allow even a little bit of line, deviation from linearity, which you would need for a dynamical collapse model or something like this, you immediately get tremendous amounts of non-locality and all kinds of problems. So it's really, we're uh, really stuck. I mean, it's very tough to imagine a theory that swallows quantum mechanics as a special case. Yes, uh, I, I agree. Yeah. So, I agree. The, yeah. The question is where, where would this extension go? That, that, that's exactly the question. In which direction would you extend? And I fully agree with you that um, changing linearity has uh, drastic consequences. And in a way, we can almost rule out quite a lot of these extensions in that direction, precisely because of these inconsistencies. Yeah, so I, I think we're kind of like-minded on maybe how quantum foundations is going to evolve over time, pushed by this, you know, advancing quantum technology. Yes. I didn't know before we started this interview that you had some intellectual connection to David Deutsch. So if I knew, if I had known that, I, I would have guessed maybe you and I are like-minded on this question. But let me shift gears and talk about practical stuff like quantum computers. Yes. So I think a lot of people listening to this podcast who are not really physicists, but our technologists are super interested in quantum computing. And so, you know, I, I would, I think because there's now a lot of money involved and there are companies trying to raise money and selling actual products, which are a kind of quantum computer, I think there's a lot of hype out there in terms of yes. what's really possible. And so 
you know, some basic questions like, oh, when will someone actually implement something like Shor's algorithm at a scale that actually matters? Yes. You know, do you have any sense personally of will that be 10 years or 50 years from now? What, what's your feeling on this? I tend to be, I tend to be more optimistic simply because, like I said, um, there was a point at which in the late 90s, um, the field really started to uh, develop I in an exponential manner. I mean, you, you were really at that time surprised by the ingenuity and, and by how many qubit platforms are out there. And then m maybe five or six years ago, you mentioned that, that some heavyweights uh, started to get engaged on, on the industrial side. And now we have almost every major company runs, runs some kind of experiment and operation on, on quantum computers. I think it's, it's difficult to predict because the platform we talked about, the superconducting qubits, they are natural uh, because they already belong to this solid state domain where the semiconductor, you know, the conventional computers rely on. And somehow it seems to me that the choice of, of companies like uh, Google and uh, Microsoft and IBM, the choice of superconductors is simply um, out of convenience because these are maybe the easiest to integrate with, with the rest of the solid state that, that would support this kind of computation. Because remember, qubits are just one part of this, but the supporting elements that you need to make a quantum computer really, for all practical purposes, are really classical in many ways. And, and this support comes from the solid state. So you gain a lot by doing that, but I think the fidelity of your qubits is frequently compromised with respect to, for instance, what you could do with cold atoms. I think if you're a, a purist, if you're a physicist, you would probably say it, it might be better to try to build these things bottom up and to take systems one by one that you know you can already control with hugely, um, uh, with, with very high precision, in fact. So these are things, you know, where you can do a gate with uh, the fidelity of six nines, you know, 99.9999% efficiency. And, and this is really enormous. This is something that superconducting qubits cannot do. So with superconductors, you know, you read the news that um, people have achieved uh, 100 qubits or sometimes even 1,000 qubits. What you have to bear in mind is that they're not really universal. They don't have a high enough fidelity that if we were to scale them up, you could really do Shor's algorithm with a high enough fidelity to really outperform anything classical. At the other end, atomic qubits, they can have individually high fidelity, but then uh, as we put more and more of them together, they do actually decrease in fidelity. So there we are talking uh, about at most maybe 10 quantum bits that we can now manipulate. And that, that really limits the kind of computation that we can do. We cannot do too many gates with these qubits, maybe a hundred gates with, with, with 10 qubits, which is not much, you know, you, you cannot really uh, do a useful algorithm with that. But I think if I extrapolate this, you know, if, if, if I think that some 20 years ago, we barely had a single qubit in any of these um, implementations. And now we are talking almost approaching 50, maybe sometimes even 100 qubits of lower fidelity. I'd be more on, on the optimistic side. I, I would imagine that within the next 10 years, we would really have a, a, a non-trivial computation uh, that would definitely outperform anything that we can do classically. E even you know, a network of classical computers could not compete with that. So just to be precise though, so this milestone where a computation is performed that really just couldn't, you couldn't imagine doing it with classical yes. computers of the current day or of yes. the 10 years, that could be though a kind of quantum simulation where you're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're deducing some property of some quantum system yes. that, that, you know, the, the size of the Hilbert space is just so huge that uh, yes. we could do it classically. But we do get some result, even though we have a very kind of noisy, perhaps noisy set of qubits that we're using to do the calculation. Um, yes. That, I think that sounds plausible, but um, like doing, doing a shore factorization of a number that actually matters, right, for, yes. for say, uh, 
you know, uh, blockchain or crypto security. That seems quite hard, right? I mean, you, 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 you need, uh, even if you have like six nines, you probably need some additional error correction, right? Which, which, which causes some, you know, really brutal overhead on the number of qubits you need and things like this. Uh, do you think something like that is possible in the next 10 or 20 years? I, I think so. Again, I, I, I'm optimistic. You are right that there are all sorts of simulations that people are doing, which already are, are very hard with, with conventional computers, but probably they don't yet constitute anything exciting in terms of algorithms. And even, even on the physics side, we're still not at the level where we could say, oh, here is a phenomenon that we don't really understand in, in, in complex systems. And now by simulating it on a quantum computer, we can actually understand it. I mean, you know, there are lots of hopes that we can understand even uh, more complex chemical processes in, in, in this way. But I think even there, we are not at this level where we could achieve this. I think we need many more qubits. So it's in, in a way, it is similar to what you mentioned about Shaw's algorithm. And I think at the moment, the only way we can see how to do that is by e engaging error correction. I think you are right. Having, having stable qubits on their own without investing extra redundancy to correct for errors, it seems unlikely at present. It's not excluded. You, you could think of technologies that could actually be robust and quantum mechanical, possibly even at room temperature. Uh, you know, physics does not pro prohibit that in any way. But it seems unlikely from this perspective that this will happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the, the road will probably involve quantum error correction. Uh, but even then, you know, with this, uh, with this huge involvement experimentally, I, I'm still on the optimistic side. I think if you say, you know, 20 years, it is possible that we can, that we can even get to the Shor's algorithm in that time. That would be f fantastic. It would be fantastic, I think, as well. <laughs> it would. It would also cause a huge uproar in uh, all kinds of security, crypto security, <laughs> things like yes, this. Yes, I think this would be a huge application. You are right. This really would matter a lot in the real world as well. So, on the obviously, there's been tremendous experimental progress. I have kind of lost track of the quantum algorithm side of things. Are there quantum algorithms that give speed ups? on things that we really care about that are as dramatic as say Shor's algorithm, or is that still the best example? I think that the, the best example may even be, so there are all sorts of variants of, of Shor's algorithm where people have applied this to a, to a range of problems, but it seems to me um, the thing that will really be useful is Grover's search algorithm. That's mm -hmm. another algorithm. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't achieve, as far as we can tell, any exponential speed up. It's only a quadratic speed up. But it seems to me that in practice, for instance, if you're talking about an element of a database with, with a million elements, and you know, if you, if you say classically you need on the order of million steps to, 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 to get to the right element by simply inspecting them one by one, if you like, then of course, you know, a square root speed up means within a thousand steps, uh, you could actually get the quantum mechanically with a quantum computer. And it seems to me that all of these subroutines in, in, a, in the ultimate quantum computer that we'll all be using hopefully one day will be of this kind um, of, the, of the Grover type. Maybe ultimately that is the most kind of ubiquitous application, even though it's not exponential. Uh, the exponential ones are more specialized and of course, there is a class of these problems that are very important to us and that are related to Shor's factorization. But I think the search will actually be the, the main application ultimately. I, th I think technically, I mean, even I think factorization, it doesn't really take exponential time. It probably takes high polynomial time. So even yes. Shor is kind of a high polynomial speed up. You're right. Um, but, but should I be worried that the two main algorithms that are going to, quote, pay for all this quantum computing research, uh, they were already invented right away at the beginning? No, I think, I think there is a lot of, you, you're right that, that these are the major developments really that, uh, that we have. There are many 
applications now, uh, which which actually are applied to all sorts of kind of quantum mining, you know, data mining problems. Uh, there are variants, of course. Ultimately, what you do is is you're obviously applying uh, this gignomas superposition of many qubits to try to simultaneously probe all of these aspects and then interfere them to to come up with the kind of final solution. So obviously these algorithms are all naturally uh, within quantum mechanics related to one another. So I don't think there's any worry there. And it seems to me that as we develop our quantum computers, it seems to me that many more algorithms will simply happen and come up as we develop our quantum computers. At the moment, people are simply busy worrying what can I do with, you know, with a small number of qubits? What can I do with 10 qubits? What can I do with 50 qubits? What can I do with 100 qubits? But I think as we manage to achieve larger and larger superpositions, I think all sorts of new applications that possibly we can't even foresee now will, will in fact happen. So I'm also optimistic about these developments. All, all you need to remember is, is simply the development of classical computers and how little people could you know, in the early days, in the 40s and 50s, how little people could even anticipate of what was going to come with the development of personal computers, for instance. And I think that kind of revolution will also take place with, with quantum computers. Yeah, I hope you're right. I, 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 I think the, the question, I mean, there's a kind of pessimistic scenario, not technologically pessimistic, but kind of algorithmically pessimistic, which is that you're going to go to a lot of trouble to build these things, but the ways in which they actually, other than quantum simulation, I mean, quantum simulation yes. has its own huge set of applications for just, as you say, understanding chemistry or material science or whatever, but or quantum chromodynamics or something. But in terms of it, the pessimistic scenario regarding algorithms, or I guess what you'd call quantum complexity theory or something is, oh yeah, you're going to get these very special class of speed ups from quantum computers, but, uh, we've kind of already figured out what they are and they, you don't get, you're not going to get anything beyond that. That, that seems possible to me, although it's, it's perhaps. It does seem, you're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, there are computer scientists who come to mind, uh, who say that uh, as you know, with the improvement of classical algorithms as well, that ultimately they will catch up and, and in fact the quantum advantage will, will really become minimal in this case. It is a possible view. It, it seems unlikely to me, actually, uh, yeah. but it, it is a possible view to maintain. I mean, I, I have a colleague who does, uh, a, a develops certain methods for fermions and spin one half cal calculations with spin one half particles, but using classical computers. And he's always saying that actually, yeah, the gap is not really that big between what you guys think yes. you're going to do with your quantum simulations and what we can almost do now with just smarter. Yes. But I, but I, on, on the simulation side, I, I'm more optimistic because just the, the huge size of the Hilbert space is just yes. a problem for classical computers. It's a problem that's directly addressed by the quantum computers. So I'm more optimistic there than anywhere else. Yes, almost certainly. I think these these uh, first big applications are more likely to be on, on, the, on the simulation side. And, and I agree. I think clearly that was Feynman's original motivation as well to say, well, we, you know, using quantum systems to simulate themselves is clearly more efficient than using classical uh, bits to do the same thing. And, and I think that is the, the main drive at present. Yeah, no, he got it right away. Yes, <laughs> I think so. That's it. That was it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Well, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've gone uh, well over an hour now, so I should probably let you go. Is there Are there any final comments you want to make uh, before we finish? No, 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 not at all. Thanks a lot for, uh, for asking me all of these questions. I think it's, uh, it's very exciting, and, and both of us like this direction, I think, uh, which, which is really fantastic. Yeah, I think in some qualitative sense, you know, the, there's still mysteries in quantum mechanics and the, the experiments you're involved in are, with are really pushing us toward, you know, the resolution of those really biggest of all mysteries, actually. So uh, I, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great.